the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I am geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea Mauna Loa volcano update. Today is Thursday, August 12th, 2021, and we have a little bit of uptick in earthquake activity on Kilauea, uh, not a whole lot of change in Mauna Loa, and we have a special uh, presentation for you guys on Pele stories, geologic Pele stories, connections based on a USGS release from a few years ago. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover all the monitor, monitoring signals on both volcanoes here. We'll collect questions. Dan will be monitoring our streams in our chat. So pass your questions along to him um, and he will uh, put them together for us at our, at our break and after our, our special Pele presentation as well. All right, so uh, anything you wanna, wanna Say today, Dan, start, start us off. I don't have really anything prepared. We do have another episode of Drones On to premiere immediately following this live stream. We'll be covering June 6th and 7th and some pretty heavy footage in there. Um, not too long of a video, so check it out uh, immediately following this live stream. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Dane. So, all right, we got showing you guys one of the two most recent images released by the USGS, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, HVO. And it is over here. This is a view taken from the ground um, on that down drop block, looking at that with the West Vent complex down over here on the right part of this image. 
can see a little bit of this upper crater rim here. I remember there was a crater inside of a crater inside of a crater inside of a crater and so here's, here's a level uh, of the ledge that they're standing on looking down into this thing. See some some bits of collapsed slab here in the foreground and then you see this island back in the back here and you really can see pretty well all these different terraces and different terraces that formed different as a lake was receding from covering the entire crater floor and receding back towards the, the west vent, ultimately closing up and ending not quite three months ago, right? And that's one thing that's coming up here is in less than two weeks will be the, the three-month milestone that marks the technical nomenclature, the, na the naming of whether this eruption will be officially over or if it could potentially resume again. Right. And that's nothing really significant in geologic terms. It's just an arbitrary definition that, that people have. But it's you know it's a something to entertain ourselves with, since fortunately this volcano is not threatening any people and doesn't look to do that anytime um, in the near future, given the current signs here. So um, all of the activity has been upticking in the summit, kind of underneath this region up here of this lava lake. Um, you got to remember that one thing we've been keeping track of is that this surface has been tilting a little bit in this area where it's been measured over here with that automatic laser rangefinder and Perhaps it could just be some local variations, but you know, there's also the possibility that since the interior of this entire pond is still liquid lava, that it could be tilting a little bit and tilting and not exactly sloshing, but you know, you could be uh, displacing some of that more mobile liquid and then causing some slight changes in the surface in that in that manner. So that's interesting to see here. And let me zoom out here so you guys can see the source of this. this is August 10th. Uh, views of Hale Ma'u Ma at the summit of Kilauea from the USGS. They're talking about how they're collecting um, photos across the west and south rims of Hale Ma'u Ma'u. And they're going to use uh, that, use structure from motion software to create a 3D model of that crusted surface from that ground pass. Right? They've done that with helicopter flights before, and they've done that with uh, some drone images before. So one more way to do it, um, like walking around on the ground. So interesting to, to see that. So yeah, Mike Zoller with a photo there. And then one more picture um, from a few days before, on August 6th, of a GPS campaign going on um, in this area um, of the Ka'u Desert here. And so they're saying this is an annual campaign where they are they will temporarily deploy in instruments in addition to the, the all the permanent ones that are online. And then they can compare those on a yearly basis and get a bigger tighter, denser grid network of what's going on across the whole volcano. So that's something we'll await, await results from at some point. And you can see that they're uh, monitoring Kilauea, but nothing is going on alarming enough to stop them from their regular summer field work is what's happening now. So as a field season continues here and ends here at the end of summer, you can imagine that these campaigns are going to be ongoing. Right, until activity picks up enough that they are forced back to something more short term. So, look at the monitoring, monitoring signals. Here's the infrared camera. Really, no change. Uh, still, those similar hotspots. Not seeing quite as many, but there are still some hotter spots here in that outer rim edge of that crusted over lava lake. Right, some of the spots that appear a little bit hotter than others, as well as that west vent area. But really, the hottest temperatures there are in a range of 200 degrees or so Celsius. So it's really not as hot as lava. It's just the, the heat escaping from that still molten interior uh, of that thing. And since we were keeping track of that changing depth of the lava lake surface, here it is. It was going down, and it did this kind of weird little wiggle right here. That's what we're talking, referring to there, a couple of these little wiggles. And actually, now it seems to be kind of steady again. It's interesting how it had a couple of little dips and what's going on there. The overall trend has stayed the same and you know, some curiosity we can look into in the future once again here. But um, overall, the long-term trend seems to have resumed. There were those couple of variations, but there's nothing alarming happening there either. It's not like it's really tilting and looking like it's going to um, burst through or anything like that. Right? So not no signs of imminent change there. So Really, it's all in the earthquakes, but before we get to the earthquakes, where we spend more time, let's cover the rest of our deformation signals here. And here is our uh, tilt for the last two days in this upper panel. 
you can see there's been a deflation inflation trend here not very large um, one and a half microradians there if we go back to the last week here we can get a little bit better view maybe we're talking about four microradians in total deflation and it's coming up kind of slowly it's not our typical really sharp down and then really sharp up it seems to be kind of wiggling its way around so it may be more to do with the movement of magma um, locally causing small changes right this is only four microradians it's not a massive change um, very small minor adjustments as it's as, as it's filling filling up and, and sending magma into all the different corners that it can reach in its reservoir system there um, one thing that I kind of imagine is you know we're you know I have I have kids that go to the beach and so we blow up these strange inflatable shaped things so you start blowing up one of those things and you try to blow around a limb it takes a certain amount of pressure in one of those big long tubes to like get around and inflate the wing of that flamingo or unicorn or whatever it happens to be kind of thing and so maybe something to, to an analogy to maybe help a little bit and though maybe i didn't deliver it quite as well as i could have there still you can see over the last month it's been an overall inflationary trend with only a little bit of these little variations this one looking more like a regular deflation inflation this one over here looking not so much like it but still having a deflation inflation pattern and then this larger one that we see here that just occurred uh, on the ninth uh, evening of the ninth year and um, hasn't quite recovered from that small four microradian change there so over the last month here you can see that we're in a range of 10 microradians overall and from minus five here to positive well, somewhere like in there it would be five or so so not quite here there but maybe averaging it out right there so so um yeah that's the 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 tilt plot it's inflating it's not changing very alarming it's pretty slow and you know slow and steady inflating there um and even this little variation isn't anything massive even though it's interesting and noteworthy as well so here's a gps and the gps is looks like it's a data point short here in the end but we'll see what happens with that but it's still not showing any any change there pretty steady definitely increasing at a fast rate not at an alarmingly fast rate like you might imagine something like this was right when i was doing that earlier on we're not seeing that zoom into that that area right there right right here if it starts doing this kind of thing that's when it's alarmingly fast and then that was that time of the intrusion and then this was a time time of the eruption that followed it right there so it's not looking quite like that although it was coming up pretty fast Right. no change and no acceleration of it is the noteworthy trend there so that's essentially everything apart from the earthquakes um, we might as, well, might as well check it on the east rift zone there is a little bit of a little wiggle and tight curve on here also Looks like we're also also missing data point here so maybe something on the software side here um, but the scale over here is half a centimeter one centimeter half a two centimeters so this is really tiny little changes at Pu'o'o compared to the changes we're seeing at, Pu at uh, Hale Ma'u Ma'u right where the scale is five centimeters for each of these um, hash marks here so a uh, much quicker change and why it's more noteworthy so cut to the chase here the earthquakes this is the past week of earthquakes on Kilauea let me zoom into it so you can see it a little better here um, it's showing 660 earthquakes over the past week that's getting up there for a number of earthquakes in the week um, so we'll look at that here shortly uh, you can clearly see delineated the summit area around that active lava lake area uh, you see there's an interesting little cluster over here by Kilauea which is interesting it's kind of on its own there um, you see a little trend of that upper southwest rift maybe barely a little bit but much more so you see the seismic southwest rift expressing over here to some degree and really the, the star of the show has been this um, upper east rift or east rift connector area right here that's really been flaring off um going uh, up migrating down that 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 connector to that main part of the east rift zone over here which is also showing seismicity um, elevated right so you see a lot more around its rift zone area than we have seen before as far as Pu'o'o and you still see quite a bit of south flank activity 
as well in this area. And maybe I can zoom it out a little bit so you guys can see that the south flank activity goes a little bit further over to here, but we're not really not seeing any East Rift activity past pool. So this is the part of the system that we believe is open. There's a lot of other fractures and areas, but it can fill these areas without having to push its way very, very hard past anything else, right? So it's really once those areas are pressurized enough to burst, is that is that we'll expect an eruption. And it seems to be getting there. Um, but it's still not quite there because we're seeing one signal, the earthquake's accelerating, but we're not seeing yet the tilt accelerating um, or the GPS or the gas, perhaps. And maybe you don't see that in all of them, right? You didn't see the tilt do that much last time, but you would notice other, other signals as well, right? Like the GPS and the earthquakes together. All right, so there are still earthquakes happening down in the Pahala zone, and those are included, but they're nothing, nothing unusual this week, and really the activity is mostly dominated by this shallower magma system on Kilauea here and the south flank uh, adjacent to it. And so that's the earthquakes. Uh, as far as earthquake rates and depths, here it is. Let me make sure I reload this to get the most recent earthquakes as they ha happen as I talk here. So we're looking at the past month, or earthquakes per day over here on the left, each hash mark is 20 earthquakes. The 100 earthquakes per day mark is here. You can see in the last month we reached it once, um, back on the 19th of July. But for the most part, it's been below that, and we've gathered decent earthquakes per week. Um, but overall, the pattern has been, you know, over, you know, between uh, below that 80 earthquakes per day mark for the most part, and sometimes quite a bit lower as down as 40 earthquakes per day. If we look at the last week here, in the last week going back about this far, and you can see that out of the last seven days, uh, only two have had earthquakes that are below 100 earthquakes per day, and all the other ones have had over 100 earthquakes per day, which means that for the last week, that gets us up to 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and 50, and 50 is 600, and we're still counting, right? So when you get, get up to another 100, it brings us up, up to that 694 that we saw on the map right there. So the earthquakes are picking up. It's nothing, you know, um, one day by itself. Uh, if it had just gone back down and stayed down, you might see, okay, that was just a temporary adjustment. And if it goes up and stays up, that's what we're looking for as a, an indicator of a, of a step upwards. And so it's done it for four days. Uh, we'll see if it continues that or if it comes back down and then it can adjust some more through some other, method, uh, other mes methods and means. So here we are. It's a... Uh, getting interesting on the earthquakes a little bit here. If we zoom it out though and look at the earthquakes for the last year, you can see that while we are higher than the previous weeks here, right, we actually are, have exceeded everything since July already, but there were times in July where we had more earthquakes than now, and of course there was an eruption that happened at that point. So it really has to come up quite a bit more, and if we compare that to the time back over here before the 2020 eruption, we're looking at for, for it to reach up these upper levels, 800 per week to 1,000 per week, right? So 700 is a, is a value we just had. So depending on how you cut this graph, we might have a, have this this next bar might come up a little bit further here once it actually is all said and done. We'll have to wait and see see how it how it uh, tallies it here. So that's the past year. Um, and looking at the past month distribution on the map here, you can see a little bit more why we 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 can say this is an elevated count right 2000 in the last month um you see that all the structures of the volcano activating the boundary of mauna loa the namakani payo uh segment of the kawiki fault zone you see that whole caldera area you see that uh, southwest rift you see south the, the upper east rift east rift connector going to the southeast here you see that rift zone as we described we see that whole south flank all of it lighting up we see these darker blue and purples that are the magma system um, coming in from deeper into the volcano from further down and then other areas in the surrounding surrounding parts adjusting to the weight that's all being added all this extra material is filling 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 and everything around the outside is having to adjust and within it as well so that's the pattern over the last month. It's definitely building building towards some uh, release, you know, uh, eruption, of course, is what we have in mind. Um, could be an intrusion. You could have a south flank adjustment that, like an earthquake, for example, that actually relieves the pressure. So there's all, all different ways to, to 
solve the issue of having uh, more magma than, than fits in there and starts pu pushing in the signs. And we're still awaiting any sign from HVO, whether, whether they're monitoring, for example, the, the earthquake speeds uh, changing, you know, once it becomes comes to that ultra stress state where it's about ready to burst and the earthquake directions start changing and all, uh, all, all that stuff, right? Um, there's no indication of that that I've seen or heard of yet. So we're not quite there. It's getting closer. Um, but it's a, it's a long, slow ramp we climb, right? Like, you know, maybe like climbing a mountain, we think, oh, maybe, maybe I can see the top. Maybe there it is. And you keep going in and maybe, maybe that's the top and you go a little more and still a little further away for us here still. But let's dig into it a little bit more. Here's the earthquake live map. Um, over the last 24 hours, the ones in orange aren't that many, actually. You see the ones around Kilauea area and a little bit in the East Rift connector. But mostly they're further back in time. Um, so it may be slowing down a little bit. You can't really tell as much from that one, that one there, right? Um, although it does list here um, all the earthquakes. If I sort it by largest magnitude, you can see there is a 2.9 um, occurring here in the upper East Rift connector uh, on the 8th. 2.7 on the 8th as well. And that's the south flank adjusting way over here. 2.6 on the 6th. And that that uh, southern part of that East Rift connector. 2.6 in that upper part of the East Rift connector. Um, so it was on the 6th down here and on the 8th up here. And see there's another 2.6, 2.55, and a whole bunch of those, right? So really nothing larger than three, but that's the range of, of earthquakes we've had in the past few weeks. All right, so moving on, I'll show you guys what it looks like in animation. This is the last month animated. So uh, you can see that for the first couple weeks, we had, this is kind of that background activity. It does light up that East Rift connector and a summit a little bit, but really the burst is coming right about now. You see a flare off in that connector and a summit a little bit, and also over here at Kilowiki. I uh, don't know if I can make that bigger. I've tried it before, but there we go. And succeed in doing that. Yeah, there is that flare up coming right through right there. So may have slowed down perhaps um, based on this plot over here on the right. And this is a plot that it's automatically generated, and this is for the whole island that I've generated it here, but most of this is um, from this Kilauea section. So you really you can see here how a really couple of little, little peaks up here, but it really has been decreasing. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens here next, and that's, this is obviously preliminary live data graph, uh, but interesting to see what that looks like as well. All right, since we're looking at changes and we're looking for, for what it might be happening elsewhere, Let's check in on our seismographs once again. Here is a, the pattern of, of the last 48 hours on the summit. And it's interesting to note here that over the last 48 hours, right, you know, um, there is actually a little bit more signal coming in, right? And this is, this is possibly due to more traffic or maybe it's the, the wind is different as far as rain or wind or something like that. Um, but it is showing across multiple stations and it's not showing every day, right? It's showing up on a Thursday. It didn't show up at the same time on a Wednesday. That's the curious thing there, whether maybe that area was closed or what was happening. But you, know, you see, that's true across all of the signals here. Um, so perhaps there's a little bit of tremor picking up there. Um, that would not be unexpected. It's really when we start seeing that um, really blotting out this graph with so much ink that we can't tell what's going on in the middle. That's, that's when we'll be more alarmed. But interesting to note that there is some tremor there. It's something that's been ongoing, of course. Um, but you can still see it happening, so thought we'd check in on that. Um, some of the other stations further away are a little, a little more uh, uh, muddied or harder to, harder to read, harder to see. But you can kind of see as far as the earthquake pattern, you can see these little you know, darker spots. Those are the earthquakes or other rock falls or similar kind of things. There's not ungodly amounts of them, so that's, that's kind of normal to have this many going on. So maybe there's more more smaller ones, and you know, maybe maybe if we start noticing every little dot on this one, it's a little little bit. It's still, you can see that elevated pattern right through there. But nothing really jumping out as far as here's a station where the ground is shaking a whole lot more than everywhere else. 
Okay, so a couple more Kilauea things are here. Uh, checking in a tilt, we've seen a Kahuna rising with a small amount of variations. Sandhill also rising. Kilauea Iki, I'm glad to, glad to note. It looks like it's coming back online finally. Over here. And Summer Camp is a little bit more online than it um, could be. Could it, than it has been in the past, so it's interesting to see it too. It's showing, showing that change as well. Okay, going down at East Rift. Uh, not a whole lot of obvious change. Small scales on Poor Oil, Jonica, um, South Flank as well. So GPS, nothing really jumping out. The Uikahuna Uka, Uka signal we showed you guys, that's the, the lengthening between the north and south of the caldera is the pretty typical pattern you see just about everywhere. Um, it's, it's not quite to the same level, same ste steepness as you see going up to that 2020 eruption. Um, but it is riding, rising pretty fast there. So, kind of scrolling down there, you can see there's no, nothing really alarming happening um, anywhere, including down at Pua You know, you do see a lot of this tilting to the east of everything, as you imagine that East Rift connector is swelling, as well as that Summit Caldera as well. Right. And definitely nothing happening here in the Lower East Rift Zone, just to check in on that and make sure that that's covered too. All right, so SO2. The last measurement plotted on the graph here, uh, on a, looks like it's August 5th or 6th perhaps, somewhere near, and it's between 70 and 75 tons per day. A little bit down from 85, a little bit up from this earlier, almost 60, but still square within that range of acceptable background values. So there's no spike in SO2 coming yet either is the bottom line here. So maybe the earthquakes, maybe a little bit of tremor. But that's about it, and we really need to see something else, even if it's not everything else, something else, whether it's SO2, whether it's GPS, whether it's tilt, whether it's, you know, something something else that uh, I haven't mentioned. So here's the update, text update from USGS uh, from this week. And not a whole lot of changes, um, not erupting, um, no changes in gas, no changes in uh, Lava Lake, uh, Hale Mau Mau, or an Upper East Rift Zone. It's pretty much the same information as last week, so we'll move on from that. And um, jump quickly over to Mauna Loa, which there's not a whole lot happening, so we'll do it pretty quickly before we take our break here and take some questions. And here's a report from Mauna Loa from today. And similar thing, um, not a whole lot of change. We do see 67 small magnitude earthquakes, um, and really nothing else. That's slightly up, but it's not really that high. So it's kind of the same thing as last week, right there. So earthquakes, there they are. A few northwest, a few southeast, dispersed and small. That was the last week. Here's the last month. You can see them a little better. Still for one month, it's not a whole lot of activity. We've seen a whole lot more. Um, looking at earthquake rates for the last year, earthquakes per week over here. Like we're looking at Kilauea uh, up in the maybe 600, 700 range, you know, we're at Mauna Loa down around 50. And really it's down a lot from earlier in the year where we're hitting about 300 earthquakes per week or so. So not a whole lot of change there in Mauna Loa, not a whole lot to report. Uh, we can look at the tilt, see there's been some earthquake showing up um, on the tilt here a little bit, but very, very small scale, and that's more obvious when you look at the last month when you see that larger earthquake from Alaska showing up, and then small earthquake today popping up over here as well, but really the overall trend is pretty pretty low slope here. Yeah, not a whole lot of change, not very fast. And the GPS as well, uh, still showing variation within that range that we've seen here for the last well, six months or so now almost. All right, so a couple of final notes here of USGS reports. USGS has released uh, water level data for the critter look at the summit. So if you're a researcher and you're checking out, uh, you'd like to have that information or for any other reason, um, that is released now. You can find that in the USGS main page. And the final thing is Volcano Watch released today. It has to do with a 1790 eruption, a deadly eruption on Kilauea, as titled. 1790 was a bad year at Kilauea. It says more people were probably killed by the 1790 eruption at Kilauea but than by any other eruption in what is now the United States. Because, of course, 1790, uh, Hawaii was not part of the United States. Um, several hundred men, women, and children perished during explosions at the summit of the volcano. So, big boulders. Here's one that's 
larger than the six foot four gentleman uh, who's lying on this rock that was thrown about a half mile, one kilometer um, from the floor of Kilauea Caldera onto this northwest flank, probably during the 1790 eruption. So big eruptions, uh, big explosions, um, something that we've talked about before, but since we may have some new uh, new audience members here, we'll re review it a little bit as well. There was an, uh, a Hawaiian army, uh, the army of Kiowa, that was camped by the volcano, and the army split into three groups. And as they were exiting, the middle group was the one that got blasted by an apparent uh, uh, pyroclastic base base surge, like the hurricane force winds of hot steam and ash uh, that were suffocating, and uh, that's likely what killed those people. And when a third, when that third party of, of warriors and army, right, and armies in those days were not just the the men, but also their families and their their animals that they were uh, campaigning with, right, they needed to feed themselves, and as they marched around. Um, all of them um, um, were, were enveloped in that second group, and then the third group coming upon them um, found them all um, in embrace, uh, lightly scorched, but nowhere, nowhere burned, um, which was interesting, right? So it was really like a suffocation kind of thing. And, and, and the accounts of deaths have varied widely, um, but uh, that is likely, right? Likely to be uh, several hundred um, women, men, and children. Uh, caught in that blast so uh, they do go through uh, uh, mentioning Don Swanson's uh, studies and publications there they talk about the three explosions with that were, were took place within minutes or hours one of them that was wet right so maybe there was water down there that when it blasted up all that ash got got soaked in the water and it fell down as mud and that's something that could have been imprinted by people walking around in that, in that time and left a lot of those footprints in the Kau area, Kau area, Kau Desert Trail. Um, but then you had uh, uh, the second large explosion that rose up to forty or 50,000 feet and then after that is the one that colla when it collapses down and it spreads sideways and, and envelops the, the army. So that there's a lot more detail. I don't want to read the entire thing for you guys here. So um, we'll leave it at that, um, but there is uh, some more information about the the causation, perhaps, whether it was uh, fresh magmatic gas or whether there was groundwater involved. Um, it probably was occurring in a deep caldera uh, near the groundwater, but whether the groundwater was responsible or not is the question really there. Um, and uh, so uh, the extent of the collapse is also not, not exactly... Um, demonstrated there so something something to to look at as well one interesting thing there is an age of a lava flow in lower puna of 1790 but they do note here that that is an interpretation not an observation if the flow were erupted in 1790 then by analogy with 2018 then that could have been linked to a summit collapse uh, along with explosions like that right that could have triggered explosions so it's not enough evidence uh, speculative uh, but that is up our alley there that's something that that is a possibility, a possible model for us to consider as we try to um, come to terms and, uh, with what this volcano is, what it does, and how we live on it there. So that deadly eruption um, back in 1790 is something that, of course, we want to study to make sure we avoid in the future. And we'll come back to talking about this when we come um, full circle with our stories of Pele, which are next, and uh, they are coming from this USGS Open File Report 2017 compiled by uh, James Kawikawa and Janet Babb here. That was a workshop combining traditional Hawaiian knowledge with scientific thought, and so that's, that's our teaser for what's to come. But before we do that, we will say some thank yous. We will discuss some questions and topics, and... All right. Yeah, so let's get into some of those thank yous. Uh, we have several to go through. I do want to thank some of the people that have been making donations. Uh, they've been making them on hawaiitracker.com slash support. It's the best way to contribute monetarily to us, and we really appreciate any and all support. If you can't make a monetary donation, that's fine. Consider like, subscribing, sharing the video. That really goes a long way. Uh, I do want to shout out a few people that did make those donations. Mark D, Mel S, Victoria D, who says, Mahalo for educating me, gentlemen. And Timothy H., who says, uh, just mahalo. So appreciate you guys. Uh, we also appreciate our sponsors. We have two today. The first one is Kaleo's uh, Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa. They do um, 
some traditional cuisine with some unique twists to it and also some local dishes as well. Their fish and chips is awesome, especially when it's mahi mahi. They have indoor outdoor dining. You can get takeout there, which is, you know, with all the COVID stuff going on, maybe the best option. Uh, but you can ch check them out. They're right in Paul. If you're visiting or local, it's always a good place to uh, stop by and grab some food. Um, so we appreciate them and their continued support. Second one is Kalani Tours out of the Kona out of Kona. They do a variety of different tours, uh, smaller tour groups than many of the others. So you get that more intimate and more personalized tour as opposed to the big box style of just cram everybody into the van and shuttle them around. So and the, we appreciate them because they've been sharing a lot of their adventures with us on Hawaii Tracker. I've been posting photos that they've been uh, collecting as they go about doing their tours and they have some really cool stuff in there. And we do those on Hawaii Tracker doc, uh, sorry, we do those on the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group, which if you're not a part of, I'd recommend joining. And we are finally brought to you by a grant from the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Puna Strong, Puna Strong Grant, which is helping us uh, continue these productions and all the different reporting that we do on HawaiiTracker.com and the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group. So we appreciate all them as well. I think that gets us through it. Uh, yeah, mahalo everybody, mahalo. Yeah, county of Hawaii and that last part as well. Right. Uh, I pretty appreciate everyone's support. Thank you guys. So, um, Marin had a good picture, a good question. I sent you an image, and it's of the B1 camera. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is that little wisps of what looks like SO2 off of the left hand side. And this was one of the more recent shots that I just grabbed off of there. Okay, on the left hand side, yeah. Like, yeah, it looks like steam on the right, more steam, the steam that we're used to, but that left looks SO2-ish to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's been there's been some other steam and sulfur deposit looking areas in that on that side as well. Not as much as that um, north side for sure, but um, yeah, interesting. Um, we could maybe look. The only thing we could possibly do here is let me let me go back here to. Um, Let's see how, how I'll get to this here uh, to show you guys. If we go back to, nope, not that one, that one maybe here. All right, this is, this week, and if we go to the past month, I'm down here at the bottom. We do have some additional SO2 monitors here, a couple of them. Let's see if I can get those bigger for you guys. But there they are. So, yeah, of course, it depends on the wind direction, of course, whether we pick those up or not. But, you know, we, we can see here that there have been some little wiggles, right? We're in a range of 0.15 to maybe 0.25 ppm right, in this one. And yeah, there have been there have been times where there's been a little bit more. There could be some weather effects too. You know, um, right now it is a little bit sunnier up here than it's been in a while. It's been pretty wet up here on top of the top of the mountain for a while. So it could be something like that that's affecting it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll keep an eye out. You know, the measurements. You know, the last measurement is from what was what did it say there? The the sixth or something, right? So it was a while ago. Could be something popping up still. So yeah, interesting. This interesting little photo. It's current look up there. Um, get into the next question here. We have a question from Simpgrus who asks, "How far beyond the?" This is a question we've had many times, but it's been a little while since we've gone over it again. Uh, how far below the crusted surface of the lava lake do you think that uh, the molten stuff begins? Are we talking, and he's asking, is it one meter or deeper? The, um, the it's, yeah, it's, it's probably, it's probably about a meter ish. I'd say, you know, um, maybe, maybe it's two meter ish, something like that. But yeah, right. I'd, I'd say probably about it's a meter, uh, more likely closer to a meter. Right. It um, always depends where you sample that thing. Cause it's so much undulations and we saw how one side was inactive and crusting over before the other side. So there's some nuance there, but yeah, yeah it sounds about right. 
Yeah, that's, right. yeah. Um, that's the scale of it, right? We haven't done any calculations to give you exact numbers, but that's, that's, that's the order of magnitude that you're looking at for sure. So this is a question that's going to take a little bit of dancing to get to. Um, what magnitude earthquake would be strong enough to set the volcano off again? So it's all about how uh, how close it is to a breaking point, right? You know, I mean, if we we're if you're we really close to the breaking point, then you know, a rock slide could do it, or you know, some tidal force or a small earthquake that's a magnitude, I don't know, maybe as small as magnitude three, we'll call it three and a half or something like that, right? There's like the kind of right. big enough ones, right? But you know, it's if it's if it's above a five that you know then it can probably it can probably push a little harder regardless of you know how inflated it is right so if it's something if you get a something like a five and a five or higher that would be more significant as far as being remember, more alarming you remember right off um what was the biggest earthquake in that 2020 eruption sequence i don't remember i don't think there was yeah. anything big big like it wasn't in the six range uh, maybe no. a five maybe in a four four and a half to five range something like that yeah right and then yeah. it's just hard to use. My point is, is, it's hard to use just earthquakes as a barometer like that because, you know, we had following the 2018 eruption and the settling of the south flank, we had magnitude 5.0 pluses on the south flank. And they meant nothing other than it's continuing to settle and we just had a big eruption. That's what kind of we expect. Um, right. And then, as you said, you could have small ones when everything's set up just right. And that's the straw that breaks the camel's back or the lava creates the earthquake that's small enough to give it space to erupt right but yeah just interesting um this next one is going to be it's going back to your your hot spot to, uh talk that you presented a few months back and it's um talking about the continental crust and the uh the subduction mm -hmm. the oceanic crust um what's the Density is there a density difference between the types of crust and what causes that? Yeah, the, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, so um, the subduction does happen. Um, it is the oceanic crust under the continental crust every time um, because the oceanic crust is denser. It's made of basalt. The basalt is about two point seven grams per cubic centimeter, more or less. We'll call it right. That's kind of the, the oceanic cr crust at average density, if you will, very generally. Um, and then the continents would be something like a 2.3. It's just something like that granitic composition is just a little bit lighter. It's not a huge difference, but it's enough that when you're smashing continents and oceans together, the oceans go down. And then when it comes to ocean versus ocean, it's a matter of which one is older because at that, that point with the same starting material, whichever one is older um, is going to be colder and slightly denser because of that as well. All right, so, yeah. so for this last question, we're going to have to make some assumptions. Um, let's assume that the lava lake is hardened and cooled, right? It's uh, It's gone through the process, and we now have a hardened plug there, or whatever we want to call it, um, sitting in the crater. Would the Is it possible for a lava or water lake to return? Well, it, it it would be completely filled. The, the The rock is filling the spot where the water would be. Right. So you wouldn't see the water anymore. Yeah, that was like a, one, a once once in a lifetime thing, really. Um, right. If we see it again, we'll be lucky. We we're lucky to have seen it once. Right. And just the nuance there is that the collapse pit got so deep in 2018 that it went below the lo the water table. So we actually got to see that water table with the naked eye, which is in incredibly rare mm -hmm. to be able to do. There's legends of it, but not in modern times, not with observational science around and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, that will, that will do it. Um, that'll do it for this one. I will get another batch of questions for the end. If anybody has anything uh, related to Pele and the legends, the next part would be a good spot for that. All right, and I'll preface that by saying that I'm not I'm not a pillar expert, and I'm taking this presentation uh, largely from uh, these two guys uh, that presented as part of this workshop uh, that occurred back in 2013. Um, but actually, uh, the report was released in 2017. So, uh, conversing with Pele Honuamea, a workshop combining a thousand plus years of traditional Hawaiian knowledge with 200 years of scientific thought on Kilauea volcanism. 
and the two uh, people I'm going to uh, uh, borrow heavily from here are uh, Don Swanson, um, to, who's gonna gonna talk about the second part of the the story here when when we lean on geology of Hawaii Island um, for more recent history. But we're gonna start off with uh, Dr. Scott Rowland uh, over at UH Manoa, who was part of this as well. So if I can step forward here. He actually teaches a course uh, uh, at UH Manoa that uh, has has this as a small, small piece of it. Um, but he talks about uh, uh, the idea of Pele traveling down an island chain as the first geologic story uh, that is uh, overlaps with a Pele story as well, right? So the story, you know, there's kind of, kind of two layers to this. And let's talk about the, the more general version first. The idea is that uh, Pele first came to the islands in the northwest and worked her way down the island chain towards Hawaii Island. Um, and so, um, by digging down into the ocean and trying to find a spot warm enough to, to make her home, um, she was able to, to help uh, eruptions on Kauai, then Oahu, then Maui, and then finally made her home here on Hawaii Island. Right, that's and you know that's the age of the islands. You know the hot spot is is relatively stationary and the plates moving over it. So we have Kauai as the oldest island, followed by Oahu, followed by by Molokai, Maui, and then um, the big island, Hawaii Island, island of Hawaii. Pardon me. So uh, uh, that's the first order, right? Okay, she just traveled one way, and you know that's the the ordered islands is tracked by by the stories and. Um, of course, we, you know, this is kind of not giving enough credit to the uh, observation skills of the early Hawaiians. Clearly, that wasn't meant, but that's only the very, very surface level here. And so Dr. Rowland has, had, has uh, done a, a good job presenting this um, to, uh, at this workshop, talking about this idea of rejuvenation as far as it being maybe that second deeper layer of what might be going on with this Pele travel here. And so... Um, First off, to uh, show uh, these are all slides from from these guys' presentations uh, as part of that release, and he does note that uh, um, that is something that he wrote um, for the Oregon State website, um, talking about the progression from old to young. Um, but it's pretty much widely accepted that's that first level of detail there. But as far as rejuvenation, rejuvenation means that the volcano stopped erupting for some significant amount of time. And then began erupting again. And so what he's done here is marked on for each of these islands the times of how long they were not erupting. So West Maui was not erupting for half a million years. East Molokai was not erupting for one million years. The Ko'olau and Oahu were not erupting for 1.2 million years. Kauai was not erupting for one million years. Ni'ihau had a 2.6 million year gap in its eruptions there where it stopped erupting altogether before it picked back up again and went for another not quite two million years there. So um, there are there are islands already sitting there essentially in a more recent layer, and then they are rejuvenated by activity, and you maybe could could consider travels of Pele to be linked to that rather than the original formation of the islands. Uh, so that's what he presents here, and we'll, we'll keep at it here. And he uh, is assuming nine centimeter per year plate speed you know um that's uh bringing all these other islands back towards where the hotspot would have been somewhere in a, re in a region of here right in there and he's got them marked in red for when they were essentially erupting that main main shield phase in blue where they stopped erupting and in yellow where they began erupting again so you can see maui began erupting right around there and niihau began erupting when it was over here somewhere and erupted all the way until fairly recently right? and you can see that uh, Kauai began erupting way back over here and erupted all the way until fairly recently also. And Oahu, same thing, began erupting back over here and erupting until fairly recently. So you can see that a lot of these have had a lot less time since rejuvenation than the actual rejuvenation itself. Right? So it's a fairly interesting time to be a human on these islands here. Right? And of course, Hawaii Island is the active hotspot here. So. Coming into Niihau here, this is the Kiiki Volcanics, uh, shown in red here. This is all the rejuvenation state volcanism, and it includes uh, um, an area here in the north. It includes this little island that we'll mention here shortly. 
uh, and includes areas on the southwest all through here and also this very southern tip over here as well. And so the main shield phase, the core of the island is over here. It's this big uplands over here. That main shield is between five and a half and 4.8 million years old, that high uplands. Right? It was active for 700,000 years. Uh, no eruptions for two and a half million years after that. And then they erupt for 1.9 million years in the more recent phase. And Niha last erupted 300,000 years ago. Yeah, so interesting. A photo by Craig Rowland here, who is likely related to Dr. Scott Rowland. And view from the north of Ni'ihau and Lehua Island. Here is that island right there. Right. And so from kind of Hillian Wise, the chants uh, say, uh, I won't read the Hawaiian because I don't want to do it misjustice here, but uh, translated on, as we landed next to an island known as Lehua. So... Pele is said to have landed on this exact island, not necessarily on the uplands, but on this rejuvenated part of the island right there. That's interesting to, to note. And moving to Kauai, uh, here is a, a map modified from Thorson and Garcia, showing in red the rejuvenated stages once again. Um, down here at the bottom, that is uh, the Koloa area. I'm zoomed in right here. Here is that old photograph that was included in their talk. And I added in here a Google Earth view of it. Right? And so there are actually um, cinder cones. One right there, right where all of the houses are built. Two, three. And this might be one here in here, four as well, right? More visible, maybe over here. One, two, three, four, right in there. Right? Showing one of the places that, that Pele visited in Kauai. So the Koloa area and in fact all those volcanics in Kauai are called the Koloa Volcanics uh, named after this spot right with very uh, young looking volcanic features and of course Kauai is very old so you don't see a whole lot of those in other places but you do see young volcanic cones in areas like this and that's because of this whole rejuvenation aspect uh, of eruptions on Hawaiian, Hawaiian islands. On okay. Oahu uh, you see similarly lots of rejuvenation, rejuvenation products over here Right, so he'll step through these and uh, talk about uh, Salt Lake, uh, Alia Paakai crater, salt pond crater. Uh, Pele, Pele dug the crater and some salty mucus from her eye fell here, according to Pukui, place names of Hawaii. Um, or according to Westervelt, who maybe embellishes a little bit more, but uh, has knowledge that's not stored anywhere else. Uh, he says, there she dug a fire pit. The earth, or rather the eruption of lava, was forced up into a hill which later bore the name of Ke Aliamanu. Aliamanu, uh, bird salt pond, is a place where Pele and her family lived for a while. And when Pele left, Pele dropped some salt. And the pet bird of Hiaka, Pele's favorite sister, escaped. Once again, from place names of Hawaii there. Some interesting place names, you know, um, telling, connecting the... the, 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 the the lineage of Pele to this place, of course, as well, on Oahu. So, but young volcanic places that are, you know, are given these volcanic stories because of young eruptions than anywhere else in the islands. Um, likewise, Leahi, also known as Diamond Head, uh, Cocoa Rift in the background here. Um, here she threw up a great quantity of fire rock, but at last her fires were drowned by the water she struck below. And of course, this is a story that goes back. Um, into, into the battle between Pele and her sister. Um, but uh, it's important to note that back in Polynesia and areas of Tonga, there are eruptions like this where magma and shallow ocean water interact, causing these big explosive eruptions every two, two to three years for a long, long time. So it's likely that this is something that the early Hawaiians uh, would have carried with them in their cultural knowledge from Polynesia. Right. So um, in summary here, um, many, but not all, because there are places Pele went to that were not uh, rejuvenated volcanics. Right? There are other areas that are maybe of, of cultural importance or other things like that. Uh, many, but not, not all the places on the older islands that are associated with Pele, and especially with Pele fighting Namaka, Oka, uh, Namaka Okahai, Kahai, her sister, uh, the sea goddess, turn out to be locations of hydromagmatic rejuvenation stage volcanism. 
The youngest is the Koko Rift on Ko'olau, about 40,000 years old. So nobody actually saw the eruptions. But as you know, it's past generations undoubtedly witnessed violent hydromagmatic eruptions, perhaps in Tonga there. So um, I've taken here an image by Herb Kane that's famous in the walls of the Jagger Museum. And if you, if you want to find, um, you can now buy prints online, herbkanehawaii.com. Um, get all kinds of fantastic art, artwork by by the artists that I consider to be the, the Hawaiian Renaissance man, like the, like a Michelangelo. Uh, right, so without getting derailed here. Here is his image on the left here of Pele and Namaka fighting um, as she's digging her fire stick, and I've just superimposed her on the right. Uh, perhaps where that knowledge might come from, those eruptions in Tonga, something like that, yeah. Taking a little, little artistic liberty there. Okay, so what I want to show you guys now is a, um, a little bit of the tail end of that, right? Because we, we've, we're going, going from part of the story where it really occurs before people were around um, to the modern geologic record that was witnessed by people who were living on a volcano. Um, but to connect the two, the, uh, the story between the Battle of Pele and her sister Namaka um, in many versions ends over in Maui at a place called Ka'ivio Pele, the Bones of Pele, over in East Maui. Um, that's a cinder cone there. Um, and so um, uh, there are a couple versions, right? But in one of the versions, uh, Namaka comes and finally um, catches up to Pele there and um, then kills her and strips her body uh, of flesh, as was the tradition in Hawaiian times, and her spirit's what lives on and then travels to Kilauea from there, right? Um, some other versions uh, talk about how um, maybe she just lived there and then died there naturally, and then her spirit moved on. But uh, in any case, Kaivio Pele is the place that Pele is said to have traveled from. And here's an animation of her, whether it was her spirit from Kaivio Pele, that cinder cone over here on the coast of southeast Maui, um, around coming onto the Puna shoreline at Kiahialaka. I think it was a place that was famous during the 2018 eruption. We'll revisit that in the future. But from there, she migrates upwards to Hale Ma'u Ma'u at the summit of Kilauea. And that's that is the path of Pele onto the island here. Um, so there we'll turn to the geology and the geologic record, and now we're going to turn to the work of Don Swanson. And Don has done all kinds of work on the Kanakakoi ash deposits in the area down, over the, down uh, southwest of the caldera, uh, including within the caldera walls there. And all that work has, has produced this um, now accepted 300 year section um, of ash deposits and other kind of fallout, right? You can see some examples of how he's really studied this at length, you know, with the shovel, digging, um, figure out what's the top of what and what, what order everything came in, what connects to where. And he uh, put this all together uh, in a presentation, which uh, is a reminder to me, you know, this is all speculative, of course, speculative correlation between oral traditions and volcanic history of Kilauea between 1200 and 1800 of the common era here. So, of course, uh, uh, the, the earlier Pele's path is, you know, also a speculation. It's interesting to see how that might fit together. And, of course, this was presented uh, in the light of um, uh, prompting um, cultural practitioners um, to look at these stories once again and see if there are any matches from there, right? So it's worth going out on a limb a little bit to see, to see if there's any connections that arise from that, from those planting of seeds there. So um, similarly here with uh, uh, Dr. Don Swanson. Um, and I've added a few illustrations here. Um, from Dietrich Varez and Herb Kanes is the one that was in the Jagger Museum as well. Um, but the point is here, when did Pele actually arrive to Hawaii Island? And his points are, she's probably is a relatively late comer to Hawaii, uh, consistent with the presence of an established society on Kauai, whose elite included Lohiao. Lohiao is the unfortunate chieftain um, who is loved by Pele, who... Uh, I, I suppose now is the time to tell a story. Uh, this is a famous story of, of Pele and Hiaka, her sister, Hiaka Ika Polio Pele, you know, that was born of the bosom of Pele. And this is a, a famous uh, Hawaiian 
epic story uh, that there is no way that I can do any justice, honestly. I can only summarize very briefly what it's about and try to recap, recap it for you guys that way. Uh, essentially, the story is that after uh, returning from Kauai, uh, that Pele tasked Hiyaka with going to fetch Lohiao for her. Um, but on thinking that, thinking that she had taken too long and had uh, essentially absconded with Lohiao, uh, Pele was mad and essentially put out a big flow and burned down Hiyaka's forest. Hiyaka was the, the deity of the, the rainforest. And so Lohiao is kind of caught in the middle. Um, the story continues that uh, Pele, uh, after burning the forest, Hiyaka arrives with Lohiao in tow into Hilo. He comes up with her uh, to Kilauea Summit, into the house of Pele. And there they show affection in front of her. And she is infuriated, of course. She kills him, again, because Hiyaka actually had to bring him back, to, back from um, the afterlife uh, earlier in her quest. I kind of glossed over that. Um, but uh, after being buried by lava flows, Hiyaka then digs for Lohiao's body, and as she digs and throws out rocks, she's uh, marking explosions coming from the crater, and excavation of the crater, the collapse of the caldera itself. Right, and so we'll look at the details of that uh, here. That's the, the 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 skeleton structure of the story for you guys, and essentially all I can really really go into without going on forever here. So. Because uh, she's going to Kauai and she's uh, meeting Lohiao, and Lohiao is already part of an established society, that is one indicator of Pele being a rel relative, relatively latecomer compared to the early Hawaiian, Hawaiians, right? <clears throat> so her rifle may have been sometime in the late 1300s, one or 200 years, or more after the first Polynesian settlement. Now the settlement date is contested. Uh, Don, who presented this, presented this um, favors that 1220 to 1260 CE settlement day, date uh, based on the, the most rigorous and careful uh, inspection of the data and consistent with uh, other data sets across other parts of Polynesia. So without going into that, that hole, um, that would be consistent, you know, if, if there was settlement in 1220 to 1260 and then one or 200 years later, you're seeing uh, these stories uh, occurring in geologic time here, um, lining up with the uh, formation of the caldera here. Right, this bottom shot here by Dietrich Varez, I want to make sure we don't miss this this one that was in the Jagger Museum for so long, right? showing the, the approach of uh, uh, early Hawaiians to the early ocean entry, perhaps uh, encountering the elements of lava and snow visible on Mauna Kea here in the top right. Um, all in one place. So I put things a little bit out of order here from what, how Don presented them, but there is a question of Isla Al. Uh, Isla Al uh, doesn't come up in very many translations. There is Westervelt um, that suggests that Isla Al ruled over Kilauea before Pele arrived. And so this is something we'll d dig into more in the future. We're just going to mention it briefly here that uh, there there is uh, uh, some. Um, tension there between Pele and, I and Isla Al, um, and uh, he essentially is displaced, uh, whether she boots him out or he leaves voluntarily and she's a caretaker, is the, the, the modern debate now. Um, in any case, uh, Isla Al, the eater of the forests, suggests lava flows entering a forest as would have happened during a lava shield from 1000 to 1400 CE, uh, common time. Right, so this Thus, the time of arrival of Pele in the late 1300s is consistent with that date of that summit shield. I was around to build a summit shield, and looking at the geologic map here, um, it's these kind of purplish lava flows over here, right? They're called the observatory flows. That is the Isla Al um, deity's lava. So there, it's, the, it's over here. It's kind of underneath a lot of stuff, and it's covered by a lot of the more recent eruptions. But it's under all the stuff, kind of all around, um, but covered up. Right? And then afterwards, um, it's, it's, during, it's while that happens that uh, uh, Pele is arriving and bringing Hiyaka, and Hiyaka, here's Hiyaka, um, brought um, 
in an egg, born of an egg, um, Pele essentially being a surrogate mother to her, uh, if I can take the liberty of calling it that. So, Birth of Hiaka by Dietrich Verez, you can, once again, DietrichVerez.com there. Check that out. So, moving on, um, this is a little bit confusing, but uh, there is uh, eruptions um, that correspond to this image of Pele burning Hiaka's forest over here. Right? Uh, this is, uh, or kind of, it was in the Jagger Museum as well. Story of Pele and Hiaka by Dietrich Verez down here as well. Thought I'd throw some art in to, to make it a little bit more visually exciting for you guys. But the map here is showing in red the lava that destroyed this forest around all the ocean that corresponds to this legend of Pele and Hiaka. Now it's confusing because this lava is called the Isla Ao lava flows, and it's not to do with the Isla Ao deity. It's got to do with Pele and Hiaka. But there's also the source of these is called the Isla Ao shield. And once again, um, that's just a geologic term that is uh, un unfortunately misaligned with the, the cultural uh, information there. So, Isla Al Shield corresponds to the Pilahiaka eruption. And prior to that, the observatory flow and observatory shield that was more over here, that was the Isla Al deity's domain. Okay. So, that's one aspect of it. Hiaka was warned not to dig too deeply for Lohiao, or water would come in and put out the fires of Pele. She was warned by her brother. Um, so, how deep was that, was the question that Don asks, right? And he presented this back in 2013. This is prior to, prior to the 2018 activity, so I'll present what he had first. Um, in the 1820s, the floor of the caldera was quite a bit lower, 400 to 550 meters below HVO. Back in 2013, it was 120 meters, right? And you can see that that's what's photographed right in there. Of course, since then, it's changed quite a bit, but we'll come to that here shortly. Um, he does mention the water table is at a depth of about 600 meters below HVO. Below the water table, the rocks are saturated with water, and if a hole is dug, water will fill it. Right? Back in 2013, as we've been telling you guys for a while, you can see this is all fairly commonly talked about. Don says, I think it is likely that Hiyaka dug down to about or just below the water table. Uh, consistent with newly developed geologic ideas, the caldera was deeper than 400 meters, and probably 100 to 200 meters deeper than, than that just after it formed. The evidence, in case you're wondering, is the, the golden pumice of Kanakakoi that doesn't have any bits of lava stuck to it at all, so it's kind of just the frothiest froth of a lava fountain. So the fountain was deep down in a hole and it was just frothing out, and only the lightest stuff made it out, and that's what you see on the edge, and everything else has been buried ever since then. So that's the, the, the story, and of course, 2018 requires an update. Here is April 2018, and of course, August 2018, and we did collapse way, way down um, to intersect the water table. So I can show you guys this video that we've shown before here of time-lapse compilation of the water filling Hale Ma'uma'u from the USGS that we've kind of just stitched together here to show how that process occurred, um, taking not quite a year after the end of the collapse, but continuing um, up until this most recent eruption boiled away that entire pond slash lake of water uh, within about an hour and a half to two hours there. Ultimately ended up being 51 meters deep, 167 feet or so before it was boiled off there. So interesting to hear that talked about and then to see it actually happen. And so um, back to the question we just had there recently, you know, um, really a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Um, it really is a stuff of legends, and this is this is uh, the legends we're talking about here. So one last uh, uh, story here, uh, not described in the chants, but to quote Don, we know the famous story of Pele throwing rocks at Kamapua'a and chasing him into the ocean. Right, Kamapua'a, the pig god, depicted here by Herb Kane and Pele. Here she is battling. Uh, one time they were husband and wife, a union, and and rumored to have a child. A very fiery, explosive relationship, you might say, right? Big storm clouds and lightning in the air here. Um, imagine if there were eras where meteorologically you had increased rainfall in a volcano with certain conditions, you might have had periods of lots of explosions, right? And that's what what uh, uh, is being depicted here and what Don Swanson is referring to. And to really illustrate this, I'm going to show here this uh, uh, map that uh, map of Don Swanson's showing 
area colored by fallout from explosions, right? The the green is from the late 18th century, maybe the last one, a 1790 explosion. But that might have been the last of a whole series that goes back into the 1500s, right? And so you can see that there are other ones that had fallout all the way down to Hawaiian Acres and possibly further to Pahoa, right? Really not knowing how far it tails off because it's hard to pick it apart from what came afterwards or since as far as vegetation down there. Um, but lots of different fans of ash. And of course, to bring it back around, this is an image of 1790. Courtesy of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, or a depiction of the death of the army of Kiowa here. Um, you can see this third group of warriors arriving and finding the second group of warriors um, all lying prone on the ground here. Um, uh, many uh, in embrace. Um, so that's how it ties back to the Volcano Watch this week. So to wrap it all together here, um, from Don, um, geology in the left column here. Ages from carbon-14 or other methods, and tradition in the right column right over here, right? So after Pili arrives on the island here, uh, um, or when she arrives, Isla Al is around, building the summit shield, right, with in the era of 1,1400 CE. Right? The waning of the shield in the late 1300s, perhaps uh, coincident with the initiation of caldera collapse. We don't really know how long the caldera took to form, but it might have been an incremental thing over time. Um, is the arrival of Pele and the transition to Pele becoming the, the, the deity in control of the volcano here. Um, to the point where she's already having her adventurers by the 1400s, where this, the lava flow that covers much of Puna, uh, right, all of uh, HPP and uh, um, the one that's called the Isla Alava Flow is actually a story of Pele and Hiyaka that dates back to 1410 and 1470 CE there. Right. Collapse of the Caldera, perhaps 1470 to 1500 CE, corresponding to Hiyaka digging for the body of Lohiao. Right. There could have been many collapses. This certainly would have been the biggest one that we're talking about, the biggest event. Uh, but there might have been smaller events that occurred before then. Um, that's not quite clear and not, not a tension I'll go into uh, today, but it is published. And then finally here, explosive eruptions, perhaps when lakes were in a caldera, between 1500 and 1790, corresponding to Pele's quarrels with Kamapua'a, deaths of hundreds in Keoa's group. Right, so there, that's, that's it all together there. And that ties together the part of St Scott Rowland, um, um, recounting a possible connection of, uh, of the stories of Pele to the uh, story of evolution of the Hawaiian Islands, as well as rejuvenation of the Hawaiian Islands, to the story of Kilauea itself here, portrayed by, by Don Swanson. He does have a few things to summarize, right? You know, besides the actual uh, events that are noted there. Um, he did, does note that volcanologists, volcanologists used, to think, used to think the caldera formed and all their eruptions took place all in one year in 1790. And recently, it's been shown to be true to be to be false. I showed you guys a 300-year section there, and of course, um, oral tradition was has been saying that the entire time. So, if if Western science had taken into account earlier that oral tradition, maybe they would not have made that mistake um, and put everything into one year there. That's essentially the the looking back, right? There's a couple of things they say looking forward. Don does say that there is more lessons to be learned there, and he would like to see Hawaiian-speaking volcanologists examine all the Pele chants and other oral traditions related to volcanoes. So, um, generalized to all sciences, tsunami, earthquakes, storms, right? He thinks that his work is just preliminary, and it's only helpful if it spurs on more efforts by Hawaiian speakers who can really translate these properly, right? So that's, that's one aspect of it. Uh, Pua Kanahile, who haven't really uh, uh, mentioned yet, but is a large part of this workshop that took place in, tw in 2013, um, does note here, I'll quote her a little bit, uh, we need to start composing. And she's speaking of herself and her Hawaiian community. And she does give a little bit, bit of insight, and they did, try to, they did uh, uh, work to, to correct this, um, but at the time, this is what was documented in a publication. They don't allow us to go right by the flow and watch the flow go by as we used to, or watch the big things that are going on up there. So we cannot get it firsthand. We have to look at, look at and talk about securing videos of these flows. Kamoamoa, Pu'o'o, Kapoho are all Hulihia type of eruptions, and we should compose chants for them. Those kind of things we should write about. 
We must continue to create historical poetry about our land changes, etc. That's Pua Kanahele's uh, thought there, right? And of course, you know, it's different if you can't feel the vibration of the ground, like, you know, through your torso and, you, you know, and pounding as everyone who saw the 2008 interruption. It's, it's a different thing to feel it, to be able to express it. And, you know, that's that was what she was getting at for, at the time, what was a pool eruption, of course, uh, different times now. So we'll end it with that. And as I just, re good. just to recap, I'm not a, not a Pele expert, but that is what was presented during that workshop, which I can share with you guys um, officially here. Right. And then the story continues from there into the 2018 and the return of, of Isla Al at uh, Fisher 8, Ahu Isla Al. And the, hopefully one of the things I've been looking forward to is the, the change, the story adapting to the, all these uh, legends adapting to the 2018 eruption and that new incorporation of Isla Al returning. And that's just a whole new uh, trove of, you know, legends and uh, oral traditions that can come about from that, which is just, you know, incredibly interesting when you see it firsthand. And then you start seeing the people talking about naming it and things along those lines just to see that process unfold. So that was a really good presentation, Phil. I appreciate it. That was a lot of people were really into that one as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's our story. That'll be the sequel to this someday. We're, we still have to work on that. We need to get, you know, that's that's new. So we need to get right. more uh, firsthand accounts um, because not everyone knows the stories and there are important stories to tell as well. And we can tell them in our manner and then perhaps someone else can, can take them up and, and you know, um, go from there with them. But we certainly have, have, have is, Go ahead. Good. If anybody's interested in seeing more about these, we do have videos already made uh, where Uncle Keone Kalave goes through and explains the meaning of uh, Ahu Ila Ao and some of the reasoning for selecting that as the name for Fisher 8. And there's, yeah, we have two videos. Uh, they they go together. So we'd recommend checking those out. Uh, just type in Hawaii Pod and Ahu Ila Ao, and sure enough, you'll, they'll uh, show up. Easier, so said, I have a, easier said than yeah, done. Easier said than, just type in I'll, I'll type it in chat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll type it in chat. How about that? <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, not from chat, but from me. At what point in the uh, making this presentation did you find out the volcano watch would tie right into it, or did you did you see the volcano watch or hear about it and then be like, oh, I'm doing a presentation on that today? Oh no, no, that, that's just one of those uh, holistic things. <laughs> that I just just worked it into to it today, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, it worked out well. Um, the two of them together. Yeah, yeah. So we do have a couple questions here. Um, not exactly relating. Oh, we'll talk about the one about the segment that you just did. Not really a question, but a comment. Denise says that this sounds a like a lot like the Maori legends and their volcanoes. Uh, she took a EDX course on them and uh just the relationship between the legends and the eruptions there so that's interesting um just the the commonality of certain things uh, throughout the world yeah absolutely a lot of a lot of native cultures uh had important reasons to record these natural events and so you see these kind of stories in essentially every culture right you know i mean you know even into christian tradition where people talk about uh, a flooding of the dead sea having to do with earthquakes uh opening and closing water pathways in the area so fascinating stuff very interesting just one little thing about that there's back in the day before the written word it, there was a great deal of incentive to be able to come up with provoking uh stories to be able to preserve them in people's minds and not deviate from the story like the telephone game right where over the generation the story changes that's one of the interesting things about putting the legends to hula because then it matches it with the, the the spoken word with a tempo and a dance move as well, or you know a, a movement, and if you get one of them wrong, it feels wrong, right? If you get the the tempo wrong, and you have the other two correct, it doesn't feel quite right. So you it pres helps preserve the knowledge through the generations, and that's always interesting as well to think yeah. about. Yeah, uh, yeah, times. yeah, and and, and we you, you could go, you go another another level as well too because uh, I mean. Uh, it's, it's, 
how how to how to say it. Um, um, I don't know, prop me again, Dan. Tell me, what, 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 repeat the last thing I said. Um, just about the depth of how these stories get preserved and the different methodology in you to in preserving them. So you put things to tempo or to right uh, uh, a movement. Right, right, and... yeah. So what what I was gonna say is that that like, like the story of of uh, Hiaka Capolio Pele, for example, is 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 something that is epic literature, right? And you can't change the words to literature. It's like a poem. You can't change the words to a poem or, you know, or like a song. You can't change the words to the song. It's, it's, it's set, right? And um, it was done that way intentionally. And so it would take a master storyteller and, and, you know, the story of Yaka is rumored to have taken 18 hours to recite um, from memory, of course, right? You know, and you can't you gotta get it exactly, exactly right. So that the important importance of sharing that is just to show how much they guarded their information and and how much effort they put into into keeping it authentic and not changing right if you if you're requiring an 18 hour recitation to to, right. to be a qualified historian then okay right. that's a pretty high bar right and it scares off all the volcanologists that are just you know they want the data in a very specific format and it's like oh it's in the the data's in the the song it's like oh, okay, we don't have you know a lot of scientists are like oh, we have no way to interpret this, or it's just like that's somebody else's that's cultural that's not us. Yeah. Until yeah. somebody did it, and then they're like, oh wow, there's actually a lot here. It's like oh no kidding, huh? Yeah, it, it intersects quite a bit, and it probably intersects all over the world in different ways. And you know maybe by itself you couldn't say well definitely this is what happened just from the stories, but combined with the science, and that's really what the workshop was all about, is that it's it's worthwhile to arrange meetings between both sides and you know that's why we like to live in this in between space in this boundary space where we go back and forth you know between you know the, the actual in-depth science and the more human aspect the, the culture aspects whether it's whether it's traditional hawaiian culture or the modern living with it today culture since in the end we're all living here on this volcano um uh, on this island well, we do have one other question here. It's not related to the legends or anything like that. It's more back to the hotspot questions. Um, Freeman asks, has the conveyor belt of the crust slowed, allowing for the big island to get this big, or has the island, big island had uh, time to move off the hotspot enough for the island to start break up as uh, Maui Nui or the other islands have? Right, so uh, it's... it's uh... I suppose the first thing to say is that um, it, it, it is partly over the hotspot and that is keeping it hot and keeping it buoyant and keeping it riding high. So the whole landmass of it is sitting high relative to sea level. Uh, that was the case with Maui Nui and Maui Nui has since sunk and only the peaks of each volcano have separated it to become islands. So it hasn't necessarily broken apart per se, as rather it's just, it's just submerged, it's just receded. And so the whole, the whole bulk of it is still there underwater. And it's similar in size to Hawaii Island, um, so it, it's a uh, uh, it's a combination of um, yeah, it has happened before on Maui, and once it moves away from the hot spot, you do have some erosion. But more importantly, the whole thing sinks back down, and then the the, the the ocean will flood in between the volcanoes, and each volcano or two volcanoes together will become their each island. So that's that's how it how it uh, relates. All right. Yeah, well, that'll do it on the. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for the question. That'll do it on my end with the questions. Uh, we will be trying to make this little presentation into a stream highlight, I think. Um, and we will be premiering the latest drones on immediately following this. Maybe give it a couple minutes to get everything premiering and set up. But it'll be running real quickly after this uh, live stream concludes. That'll do it for me. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks everybody for joining. And back to you. Yeah, mahalo, Dane. Mahalo once again to all of our supporters, all of our donors. And until next week, unless something happens sooner, uh, if something happens sooner, we'll cut back in. But um, presuming it keeps up its its slow, steady pace, you know, climbing up to the what appears to be the next mountaintop, we'll be back with you guys again one week from today on Thursday, covering both of our, our volcanoes once again. So for Hawaii Tracker, Hawaii, ugh, easy for me to say, right? Okay. For HawaiiTracker.com. Almost had it. Yeah, almost. 
missed it by that much. For HawaiiTracker.com, he's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong.